All right, so I thought in the last class uh, we would do a little something on evangelism because we've touched on it. Uh, and as we've been talking about the spirit-filled identity, a lot of the questions have centered around, well, if this is true, how do I talk to someone about this? And that question has come up a lot. Uh, so if you're on camera, uh, if you're watching this class around the country, uh, this is the last class uh, of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the course. And what you're going to see maybe on camera in here is people eating things. Uh, that's right. So uh, we hope you're enjoying something there wherever you are. <laughs> but uh, Mary Beth has brought brownies. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about evangelism, but we want to talk about that in light of what we've learned and some of the principles about uh, the spirit-filled identity. So we will do that. Um, so let's begin uh, with, with the basic idea that people created in the image of God need to be tra treated as if they're created in the image of God. <laughs> you know, the, pr the problem with evangelism, the problem with when, when you start thinking about, I'm going to share Christ with someone, is that if you're not careful, it can very easily uh, become the idea uh, that you're sharing something with somebody that they don't have, and that puts you in a position of either authority or uh, a position of, um, you can become a little arrogant, you become a little pushy, uh, and none of those things are really godly, you know. Uh, <laughs> they're just not. Uh, so everybody that we talk to is created in the image of God. Everybody. Every single person. And, and they need to be uh, talked to in that way. So let's get some principles out of that. If they're creating the image of God, the first principle is simply this. Evangelism is not perfecting people in our image. That's not the point of evangelism. And a lot, a lot of what people call evangelism is merely challenging people to particular behaviors that they think are more Christian than other behaviors. That's not evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection, and what he has done on behalf of his people. That's all there is. So let me give you four key things here about what evangelism is not, and ways to avoid it. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, uh, let God be God. Let God be God. Uh, it, you know, it, it may surprise you, but the Lord is perfectly capable of, through his spirit, uh, convicting people, drawing people uh, to himself, uh, changing their hearts and minds about him. And it's true that we are witnesses of what he has done in our lives. It's true that we are his servants and we are actually called to that. Evangelism is a command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel is not optional. It's what we have to do. Uh, but you're under no pressure to convert anybody. You're under no pressure to convert anybody. And a lot of evangelism is sort of uh, kind of getting another notch in the belt. Yeah, you know, I, I was able to get the entire cabin class on that trip to can pray the prayer of confession or something. And it was like, it's, it's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Uh, so just let God be God. Uh, the second uh, issue we have to, is it's always about humility. Uh, you know, one of my, uh, uh, or, and probably for you too, but you know, one of the things that you hear most about Christians is, you know, Christians are hypocrites. And my answer to that is, you're right. <laughs> so what? <laughs> you know, that's the point. Uh, uh, it's not just limited to Christians, though, is it? Uh, but if we're not humble, if, you, if, if we're not able to say that there was a need for Christ to redeem us, if we're not able to openly admit that uh, we were in such a state that without Christ we are nothing, uh, then it's going to be hard for people to accept uh, the gospel. It will sound to them like legalism, like rules. And, and we're not there to say to anyone, 
you know, if you keep these rules and these are things that you have to do, and if you do them, Jesus will like you more. That's not the point. So I don't tell anybody to go. I, I, I ask people to come to church wherever I am, you know. Uh, it's true that I do that. But I never tell people, you know, you need to get to church and you need to stop doing this and you need to do that. And you, you know, it's just, you know, uh, humility. Doing unto others. I mean, would you really want to be talked to the way that some people talk to people about Christ? I mean, they, it, it, it's painful. And, and it's, it's hard to get Christians to understand that it's a conversation. You don't have to preach at anybody. You don't, you know, even when I'm talking, you know, you know, the problem with being a preacher is that, you, you know, you can believe that what you see me doing on Sunday morning is the kind of conversation I would have in person. And it wouldn't occur to me to talk to people like that in person. Uh, you, you couldn't. Preaching is a, is a certain thing, and you know, this class isn't about that, but uh, you know, that's not how you talk to people on a normal basis. It's just not how it's done, right? So having a conversation with people uh, is an awful lot about thinking, you know, how would you like to be talked to? And an awful lot of what passes as evangelism is talking down to people. You know, you need to do this, you need to do that, and you need to get your life right, and, you know, no wonder things are going bad, and this, you know, that is not going to get you uh, where you need to go with that. So, you, remember, we're not perfecting people in our image. Prayer and the presence of God. If there's anything... Uh, that we have to understand as Christians is that uh, the indwelling spirit is the presence of Jesus. Uh, and the presence of Jesus is not sort of this mechanical out there reality, but it's a very personal, experiential um, experience of the believer. And if you will talk to people about Jesus who you experience, you will find that it will probably save you from a lot of trying to perfect people and getting them to do things. Christianity isn't about getting them to do things. Christianity isn't about getting them to stop doing things. That's not what it is. Christ died to reconcile people to their creator. Their problem is that they're alienated from God. And when you're alienated from God, you find yourself alienated in all the other categories of what, as well. You'll be ali experiencing alienation in your relationships. Uh, you'll be experiencing alienation with yourself. We have names for that in the 21st century, you know, anxiety, depression, all those sorts of things. Uh, and, and you'll be uh, experiencing uh, alienation in your body. You, you know, you won't know uh, how to respond to a lot of things. And the message of Christ steps in right at that spot and says, you know, the, the reason uh, that Christ came was to restore, to reconcile us to our creator God, to link us back up, if I can put it that way. And that conversation, if you have it with that tone and with that understanding and talking about how Christ reconciles you and cures the alienation that you feel in your life, uh, there won't be a lot of time for you telling people what to do or be or this, that, and the other thing. You know, it just won't, it, it won't do that. All right? So that's the first thing. Any questions about that? Yes, go ahead, Paul. Yep. Do you have to suppose that, that somebody has a basic understanding of who God is? Can we even approach it to the atheist? Well, um, for, oh, for the sake of camera, Paul's saying, do, you know, um, in this day and age, do you have to presuppose that someone has an understanding of who God is? And, and that's, a, uh, that's a great question, and it's a, uh, a deep, deeper question than it sounds maybe on the surface. Uh, so I'll just give you two quick things. One, in our culture, there will be a surface uh, reality where many, many people do not um, have certainly an understanding of God in the same sense that we're talking about. They won't. 
they won't have any clue what you're talking about at all in that sense. Uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And so, you know, you may have to explore that in conversation a little bit. And so uh, the, the question still, though, is why you feel so alienated. You know, why do you experience guilt if there's no God? Why do you experience alienation if there's no God? How come you can't seem to, you know, uh, have a life that doesn't have broken relationships in it? We all experience that. You know, I'm not, don't accuse anybody of anything, but just, you know, it's just common human, we experience brokenness virtually everywhere. Um, but uh, uh, a deeper um, answer to that question is Romans 1, 2, and 3, where uh, uh, the Bible teaches that there isn't anybody who doesn't know they're, that they're created in God's image. They know. The problem isn't that they don't know. The problem is that they deny it. Uh, and so you have to work behind that a little bit. But deep in their heart, everyone creating the image of God knows that there is a God. They posture, do a lot of things. Uh, so there's kind of a two-edged sword, and it's kind of a, I, I'm sorry, Paul, that's kind of an incomplete, very short, awful answer to a much deeper question. Uh, but those are the two prongs you'd have to go at, I think. Uh, any other questions before we move to number two? No? All right. Number two, preach the gospel to yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself. Uh, and uh, in a kind of a key verse there is Hebrews uh, chapter 3. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of, uh, in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Who's he talking to? Brothers. These are people within the household of faith the covenant community, right? And what will brothers in Christ sometimes struggle with? Unbelieving hearts. Um, isn't that, I won't, don't raise your hand, but isn't that true of all of us? Aren't there days where we just have unbelieving hearts? Sure. Uh, take care, brothers, lest there be in, uh, in any of you an evil unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But, you know what but means, right? In contrast to, it's a cure, but exhort one another every day. In other words, how is it uh, that we find an anecdote to an unbelieving heart? By exhorting one another every day. Uh, and we exhort one another with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to exhort one another every day. As long as it's called today that none of you uh, may be hardened by the deceitful of sins. In other words, not uh, rehearsing with each other and with yourself the gospel every day potentially will harden your heart and that hardness brings a deceitfulness with it, a deceitfulness of sin. You begin to uh, almost be fooled by reality because the gospel is not present in your life in the way that it needs to be. Uh, so I, I have four items uh, under this. First of all, uh, you cannot survive on yesterday's manna. Do you remember the story from the Old Testament? Uh, you weren't supposed to save the manna, right? Why is that true? Because God was teaching the Israelites that his mercies were new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Uh, and so he told them, you get up in the morning and the manna will be there for you. Uh, and, and we live like that a lot. You know, we, we're living on yesterday's manna. We're, you know, we heard the gospel a few years ago, and uh, we're saying to ourselves, you know, I thought I heard it right. Well, you might have, but guess what? Today is today. And as long as it's called today, you want to be in the business of exhortation with the gospel. Uh, and that will uh, keep you certain that you are feeding yourself from the gospel every day. His mercies are new every morning. And because your life changes, you'll hear it differently. It will. So don't trust that 30 year ago, you know, thing that you went to, you know, I had the good seminar, that's all I need to know. <laughs> Pretty much did it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I <laughs> learned the Bible in three hours. See, that's not funny, Larry. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. I'm teasing. <laughs> all right. 
So, <laughs> you cannot survive on yesterday's manna. Two, uh, gospel mercies are new uh, for not just every morning, but for each and every situation. Gospel mercies are not just a daily thing, right? But the gospel is new for all your circumstances. I, the gospel is so deep and rich that there's, th th there's probably no way to mine the depths of the gospel. And, and you will live each and every day and there will be new experiences and new challenges and new ways that you'll need the gospel to get through that with. And it just never, ever stops. It just doesn't. So that, that's why as Christians, we can't sort of back off and get complacent about, you know, we're sort of one and done and we did it. Uh, it's, it, it, it's because your circumstances change so much that you'll need to do that. Unbelieving hearts are cured by exhortation. You know, if you're struggling with unbelieving hearts and you're struggling with doubt uh, and those things, uh, then the cure for that is exhortation. It's rehearsing the gospel. Uh, and and if, if we're talking about evangelism, if that's true for you, that's also true for everybody else. What people need to hear is the gospel, the good news. What did Jesus do? Why did Jesus show up? Why is Jesus known in every culture of the world? Uh, and, and people you don't realize how geographically uh, centralized most world religions are. Uh, you, you know, Islam is largely centered in the Middle East, period. I mean, it's almost all there. Uh, there there's almost no uh, Shinto faith outside of Japan. Uh, almost all the Hindus live in India, right? Why, how did it become true that Christianity is in every country of the world? Every culture of the world. There's a church everywhere. It's unbelievable. You can go to any country in the world and there'll be a gospel church. Why is that? Uh, it, it's true because Christ is true. Uh, and the only cure for unbelief is the exhortation of the gospel. And it's not only true for us as spirit, uh, having a spirit-filled identity, it's true for everybody that you meet. Uh, if, if, if they're struggling with unbelief, if nothing is making sense in their life, uh, you know, a little extra Phil Donahue or Oprah Winfrey is not going to cure that. It's just not. You have to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ that God took on human flesh and dwelt among us and uh, lived the life that we cannot live and went to Calvary and paid the penalty for all the things that we now regret and rose from the dead so that we can also have resurrection life and not be subject to death again. That's the gospel. Be willing to let people laugh at you for that. Uh, be willing to take it on the chin for that. Uh, be willing to never back off that but only do that in winsome ways uh, where uh, your speech is seasoned with grace, full of humility, uh, full of wisdom in how you're dealing with people. But I'm just telling you that the exhortation of the gospel is the only cure for unbelieving hearts. Nothing else is going to work. Nothing else is going to work. Um, and finally, don't forget that sin causes people to be deceitful. Isn't that what the verse says? Although I, I apparently can't spell defe deceitful. People, you know, you get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, and a lot of the questions that we have surrounding evangelism is, well, someone said this and someone said that, and, and you have to understand that uh, folks who have not accepted Christ, and it's just as true of us, uh, their hearts deceive them. They are misinterpreting their own hearts. 
uh, they are not describing their own hearts well. They're not describing their own reality well. And we don't either. Uh, we struggle with deceitfulness of sin. Uh, and the problem that we have to face is that without the gospel shaping our reality and giving us an interpretation of reality, we're always going to struggle with misinterpretation. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and beyond cure. And so it just leads us down the wrong road. So what, what does Paul talk about? He talks what? About the renewing of your mind. And the, without Christ, we're futile in our thinking and darkened in our understanding. And we have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, if all of that is true, you'll have to understand that what your heart is doing in fighting the gospel is that it's deceiving itself. It's saying, you know, I'm okay. I don't really need God. It's good enough without the Lord. I'm fine. This is not as bad as it looks. You know, it's like an old Monty Python movie. Remember those? Am I the only person? No? People remember it, you know? And, and, and I don't want to, you know, for the sake of the camera, I don't want to be doing imitations, you know, but he's, you know, he's going to fight to the bitter end. You know, come back here and I'll stump you to death. Remember, you know, those kind of things. And, the heart wants to hang on a long time. It will not admit defeat. It won't. It's like your kids. Remember the kids? You know, you catch them doing something wrong and they're really loud. And they, but, you know, if you catch them doing something wrong, it's like... They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to say they're sorry. All of a sudden, they did, everybody just gets real quiet. Well, that's, that heart is still reigning in our lives. You're, you're, what kind of dog is it? <laughs> Depends. <laughs> I, I, you know, we're laughing about dogs, but what do they say? A, a, a dog is, and, and I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but I, th I think they say that a dog, uh, in terms of his, you know, sort of his capacities, is about on the level of a two-year-old, uh, something like that. And, and so dogs can be, you know, funny. But if you... That, that mud I have at the house, I mean, that thing, it knows it's been wrong. It will run for cover. <laughs> it, it just will. Yeah, it will run for the cover. All right, any questions about that before we get in? Now, uh, these final 10 things are, each one of them are the, one of the principles from the last 10 classes. I pulled out the major principles and all we're trying to do uh, it's a good way to kind of review at the end, but I'm trying uh, for you uh, maybe to have a tool to filter a lens through which to read your efforts at how you share the gospel and how you do evangelism and, and how you think about having conversations about Christ with people who have questions or maybe challenging you in some way. Um, and we want to uh, kind of filter that uh, sharing of the gospel through what we've learned about having a spirit-filled identity in these kind of the top 10 lists, kind of a, not kind of like a Letterman top 10 list though, all right? So remember what we're doing, we're sharing the gospel of Christ, not the gospel of you. Okay? <laughs> all right. Ready? Number one. You no longer live as an orphan, but you are welcomed into, the, into God's family. You no longer live as an orphan, but you're welcomed into God's family. Uh, the gospel is about telling people that they can find a welcome home in Christ. You can come home. You might feel like you're out there and you're all alone and nothing is working but Christ is calling you home. I don't know. What did I just say? You want to hit the repeat button on the tape? <laughs> uh, you might be feeling as if you're all alone out there or if things are not working in your life, but Christ is calling you home. And he's calling you to a family. Uh, and you will be welcomed in that family. You'll be secure in that family. You'll never be thrown out of that family. Uh, that is what it means to not live as an orphan. And even though that was our very first class, we talked about some of the challenges in our lives where we live as orphans instead of adopted daughters and sons of God. 
Uh, it's also a way to do evangelism. Invite people to the family of God. Invite them to the family of God. Uh, number two, uh, you receive the gift of righteousness. It's the alien righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, so it's important that people understand that Christianity is not about them doing better or getting better or living the right code or, you know, I, I, and I worry about when I say this, but, you know, so much of it today is attached to politics and things like that. You know, they think Christians are this kind of political party and you just have to get it delinked from all of that and understand and help people understand that Christianity is about the alien righteousness of Jesus Christ. That he looks down and he does not love you based on any condition that he sees in you. It's not as if the Lord looks at you and he says, you know, yeah, they qualify for love. I think I'll now start loving them based on some condition he's seen. No, he loves you with an eternal, unconditional love. He loved you before the beginning of time. And that's the uh, only way you can have unconditional love, isn't it? Uh, it's, number three, uh, you're sharing the gospel of Christ. What you're sharing is a new identity. You don't get your identity uh, from uh, your outward uh, friendships or your allegiances or your clubs or whatever you're connected to. Uh, you don't get your identity uh, just because of your sort of inward views and, and who you are and your increased introspection. We don't get it outward. We don't get it inward. Christians get their identity upward. Right? We, our identity is in Christ, our creator. Uh, and that's what we're sharing in the gospel. We're sharing a new identity. So if you're having a conversation so far, if you just did uh, those three things, Listen, the, you know, Christianity is about uh, uh, the Father, uh, the crea your Creator, accepting you completely as a full-blown member of the family of God, loving you as a son in the same way that He loved Christ, adopted into the family of God. And that uh, adoption into the family of God is not anything you can earn. You don't qualify for it. Uh, it's the alien righteousness of Christ that's given to you. It's outside of you completely. God, in his son, gives you the gift of righteousness. You don't have to earn it. It's gifted to you, and he credits you with righteousness that you don't have. And that gives you a new identity in him, because now you realize that you don't have to work harder to get Jesus to love you that Jesus loved you and did all the work, and now you can rest because you are part of the family of God. That's what it means to share the gospel. And that's what I needed because I wasn't righteous and I'm never gonna be righteous. I've never been, had a righteous day in my life. I'm not gonna be righteous tomorrow when you see me either. My identity was all askew. I didn't know who I was, where I was going, what I was going to be, and I was all alone. I, don't, I didn't have anybody, but thanks be to God that through the gospel, I now have a family, a home, an identity, and I have a, a goodness that is not my own, but one that is granted to me, and I'm learning what it means uh, when I watch Jesus. That's what I'm learning. That's a different kind of gospel message, and that'll work. Uh, number four, the way that we reign in life uh, is because of the abundance of grace. Uh, everybody wants to be successful at life now, right? Uh, the, you, you know, that's, you go to the self-help section of the bookstore, it's like, how do I reign in life? How am I going to conquer things? How am I going to be better at this? And how am I going to be better than that? You can take seminars and, you know, you can do all kinds of things that you want. But the message of Christianity is that we reign uh, in life because of an abundance of God's grace in our life. That's how we conquer our difficulties and our challenges through the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, number four, uh, religious dead works won't cure our guilty consciences. Religious dead works will not cure your guilty conscience. Uh, and you can always have a discussion with anybody, if they're honest, but remember the heart is deceitful above all things, 
But if they start getting honest with you, there's no one in the world who doesn't experience a guilty conscience. Nobody. Why do you experience guilt if there's no God? Why? Where did that come from? If there was no God, if it was really true, just do you know, a mind, a thought experiment. If there was no God, uh, th then guilt wouldn't even be a thing. You know, when we were in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, and I have pictures of, the, uh, of this, you know, uh, but uh, w watching, you know, these pretty ferocious cats eating, you know, deer and things like that. Uh, and I'm taking pictures of it, and, and, you know, it's pretty graphic and all that, you know, out there on a photo safari. Uh, I assure you that, that uh, no lion ever felt one bit of guilt about eating a kudu. Not even a little bit. Why is that true? But you would. Why? Survival? No, because you're creating the image of God. Guilt is about violating of a standard. If there are no standards, you don't feel guilty. Right? Uh, so that, that's where guilt comes from. Yeah. Something like depression or something like that. Depression? Oh, depression. Yeah, if, if for the sake of camera, Paul's point is. You know, sometimes guilt is a, uh, it can almost be a harsh word in our culture. You know, people don't want to adopt that. And, and Paul's making the point that, you know, there are other avenues, other windows into that same discussion where it's like, you know, um, if there's no God, why do you experience defeat and depression and discouragement and anxiety and all those things? Those aren't, those aren't qualities of life uh, that, are experienced in the animal kingdom and among plant life. Why? If there was no God, just do a thought of it, if there was no God, there would be no anxiety, there'd be no depression, there'd be no nothing. Right? Uh, it wouldn't occur to me to be depressed, I'm just one molecule moving to my next molecule, you know, it's no big deal. Uh, so those are all conversations that you can have uh, with people. Uh, and religion of dead works won't cure any of that. Uh, you can, you know, do all the goody two-shoe things that you want to do, and that is not what you're going to need to cure it. You need the grace of Jesus Christ to, to come and cleanse your conscience of that guilt. Uh, number six. The Christian life is through the Spirit by faith. So when we're doing evangelism, we don't want to be communicating uh, that, that the Christian life is somehow uh, keeping a certain set of standards. That is not the Christian life. It's true uh, that when the Spirit indwells you, He changes you from the inside out and he begins to make you love the law of God so you'll dwell on it day and night. It's true. You'll be more attracted to doing things the Lord's way. But as we're doing evangelism, we want to remind people that uh, the life uh, that we have with Christ is a life of faith. In other words, our confidence is in Jesus. It's a confidence uh, outside of ourselves and that that confidence is increased through the indwelling spirit, that we believe that the spirit of God literally dwells in us and changes our hearts. So the Christian life is through the spirit by faith. It's not through, the, through extra good works or it's not through religious activity. It's, it's none of those things. Um, number seven. And if, and if I move through these quickly, we'll get to the brownies very, very quickly. <laughs> I'm working on it, Mary Beth. I'm getting there. Number seven, a disciple is not perfected 
but learning that we're not perfect. A disciple of Christ is not perfected, but a disciple of Christ is a person who's learning that they're not perfect. The best way that you can uh, share Christ with people is to tell them what a sinner you are. Honestly, just be honest, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it is very hard to get uh, people to do that, you know, because we're gonna, you know, give people the four spiritual laws or whatever little, you know, program that we have. And, and you know, ha have you ever had the experience of, you know, the Jehovah's Witness coming to your door or somebody like that, you know? Uh, I kind of like that. And, you know, they, they're on a track and they, they just, you know, if, if you get them off the track, they, they have nowhere in the world to go. So if you, you, you know, if you, you have a track in your head and, and, you know, you say, well, this is the only way I can present Christ, you know, it's going to be sort of, you know, derailed pretty quick. But if your only message is, I'm a sinner, I, I, I don't really, you know, I don't even know why uh, the Lord would care about me at all. Um, I, I don't feel as if I have earned anything or could earn anything. I, I don't feel like I'm good enough. I'm pretty sure I'm not. Uh, you probably know things about me that disqualified me uh, from having a relationship with God. But that's the point of a relationship with God, that my relationship with Him is not based on my abilities, because I don't have any. My uh, relationship with God is based on my trust, my confidence in Christ's abilities. And because I trust Christ, uh, he somehow uh, works on my behalf, changes me when it almost most surprises me. I really uh, am always taken aback by how he kind of moves in my life in ways that get me to places that I didn't even want to go to start with. That's what it means uh, to live a Christian life. We're not perfected, but we're learning that you know, that we're not perfect at, at all. Uh, number eight, uh, you share the gospel, not you. What we're sharing is that there's a different way to be human than whoever you're talking to is being human now. Uh, and like Paul mentioned, you know, there's the, the certain resistance to start with but, you know, there's, there's very little evangelism that isn't friendship evangelism. You, know, you can read all the books in the world you want. But the way that uh, the Lord mostly uses you to win people to Christ uh, is that you have lots of friends who aren't Christians. You should do that. You should have a lot of friends who aren't Christians. Jesus hung out with sinners. It won't hurt you. You can do it. You can do it. Uh, and in doing that, uh, let them see and talk to them about a new way to be human. Because all the ways that people are trying to be human isn't working out too well, is it? And, and you can have this conversation and, and make it pretty um, impersonal to start with. Because all you have to do is open uh, your iPad on any given day and point at the foolishness in the world and say, do you think this is the best way for us to be human? I mean, people are killing each other. Uh, you know, they're robbing each other. They're stealing. It's, you know, the world is a mess. Is this the best way to be human? Or do you think there might be another way to be human? Is there a better way of doing this? Uh, and that's the whole point of Christ. Christ comes to show us that all of our humanity is completely broken. We're in the broken down lane. You know, the blinkers are going. It's not going well. <laughs> the car is not moving. So Christ comes as the perfect human to show us a different way to do that. But the only way to access that new humanity is in trusting Christ's life, death, and resurrection. There's no access to that humanity outside of Christ. 
Because that humanity was only, that new humanity is only available in Christ. And, and that's the whole point. Uh, so when Adam failed miserably, a second Adam had to come to restore creation and God's humanity. And what God is in the business of doing right now, and you're going to see this uh, in Ephesians, uh, is that he is creating a new humanity for the new heavens and the new earth. And if you trust Christ, you're going to be with him there. And that's a good thing. And humanity will finally work the way that he intended it to work. He did it, <laughs> well, Larry, I'm not going to repeat that for the sake of the tape. <laughs> Larry's on a roll tonight. Um, <laughs> yes, he did do that on his own. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand that there's a different way of being human, and that's what Christianity is all about. There's another way to go at this. There's just another way to go at this. Uh, number nine. Number nine. Oh, we're, we're going to get out early. This is good. Uh, we require present grace for today, not just future grace. Uh, and, and when you're talking uh, to people about Christ, a lot of what they will have heard is, of course, about past grace. You know, well, you know, I went to one of those revival meetings and, you know, I, I, I got saved or, you know, something of that sort. I, or, or I went to a teen camp when I was young and, you know, there was past grace. And a lot of people you'll talk to, there was past grace somewhere. If they'll uh, sort of admit it to you, there's, there's some sort of experience in their past uh, that they can point to that they remember. Uh, and then you couple that with the idea that most people characterize Christianity as merely future grace. You know, something happened in the past and then you're going to get to live on a cloud with a harp uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and that, you know, that, that's a good deal for you. Uh, and, and that's all they think Christianity is. But Christianity isn't about past grace or future grace. Christianity is always about present grace. Always. It's always about Christ right now right here, giving me grace to be a different kind of human right now. Yeah, we're on nine. I, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we require present grace for today. We require present grace for today. Uh, you're, if, if you don't have present grace for today, whatever you did you know, 20 years ago and call grace won't get you to 4 o'clock this afternoon. You know, it just won't make it. Uh, and finally, number 10, drum roll, please. Thank you, Mary Beth. Mary Beth doing paradiddles for us down there at the end. Grace empowers us to pursue reconciliation as peacemakers. Uh, grace empowers us to pursue reconciliation as peacemakers. You know, a, a lot of what is happening uh, in conversations with people about Christ is they struggle to have a relationship with a Christian. They don't know how to do it. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure they're always right about this, but what I've often heard is, well, these people have been so judgmental with me, I, don't want, I just don't want to deal with them anymore. You know, I just don't. Uh, and some of our effectiveness in sharing the gospel uh, would be better achieved if we started with just reconciling with people. Just reconcile with people in the way that Christ has taught you to. 
Uh, and that reconciliation will earn you uh, the, the uh, grounds to have that conversation. I don't know, it might take a couple of years for them to trust that, right? But if you don't stay in conversations with people, how are you going to share the gospel? I mean, if, if you don't stay in relationships with people, how are you going to share the gospel? You have to stay in relationships. And so Christians are often looking to, you know, run for cover in the name of holiness, right? I am just too holy to hang around with you. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> You know, I, I, I mean, I can't even imagine Jesus saying that. He certainly, I mean, in the Gospels, he is always, he, what was he most criticized for? Hanging around with sinners. And what does he say? You know, it's not the healthy that need a physician. <laughs> that's, that's the whole point. Uh, so uh, you, get yourself some sinners for friends. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you already got them. <laughs> <laughs> and stick with them be their friends stay reconciled stay in conversations stay connected you know they, and, and, and show them tell them uh, the gospel of Christ and what a different way it is to be human than they're experiencing right now and there's so much confusion out there with people if you think about it you know, the reason, you know, you know, at first you can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the news and I'm looking at the culture and I'm looking, you know, and it looks like the world is imploding. And of course, in some sense it is, and, but in some sense it always, always has if you read history. But the reason that it looks like it's imploding, the reason it looks so scattered is because people have nothing to hold on to. And so they're always reaching for something new. A new identity, a new sexuality, a new way of doing this, a new way of doing that. They, they don't have anything to hold on to. Uh, and because that's true, uh, as Christians, we're going to feel this sense of being centered in Christ and having a foundation and we're rooted in righteousness and you know we're standing on the solid rock of Christ Jesus and not the shifting sands of our culture. But th that security is not designed for you to feel superior to people. That security is to give you a place to stand so you can reach out while they're in the rough waters and pull them in. All right? And that means that they're going to experience all kinds of choppy waters out there. And, and, and who knows what foolishness they might get into in the name of trying to find some way to be human in the way that they're looking for is never connected to Christ, is it? And that can lead you to disastrous results. Disastrous results. All right, so what we want to do is we want to stay in the conversation, stay connected to people, make sure that we're not being judgmental. That's not the point. We're not calling people to ourselves. We're not the Holy Spirit. We are trusting the alien righteousness of Christ ourselves. We are orphans without his grace, and we need his mercies every morning to sustain our lives. And if we do that, that gives us a new way to be human, and we can invite people into that. So have lots of people over to dinner, uh, hang out with them a lot, uh, you know, do everything you want. You don't have to jump into their sin with them, you know? But you can avoid that without being, you know, Nasty. <laughs> you can figure out a nice way to, you know, <laughs> get out of that. Um, any questions about that? All right. This was the last class. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, uh, don't forget to grab a brownie on the way out the door. Have everybody sign your yearbook. It's the last class. And we'll pray and uh, we can go. Lord, thank you for the class that we've had. This 12 weeks has been... Uh, 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 learning something new about you in your word and we thank you for what you've taught us I pray that as we go uh, from this class uh, and over the summer we'll find new opportunities uh, to live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ we pray these things in his name amen